high-level overview of some of the ways we consider economic consequences in the core. And so our learning objectives for this, um, as I said, we're just going to kind of talk through high level what we consider in the Corps of Engineers when we're thinking through economics for our dam and levy projects. And then we're going to talk about why that's important and how that informs our decision making. Um, and then throughout, there'll probably be some sort of other economic considerations that maybe don't fall quite as neatly into one of these boxes. Our goal, of course, as we've been talking with the life loss as well, is our goal is to basically be able to kind of rack and stack our portfolios of dams and levees so that we can allocate resources accordingly. Um, and then also from that, determine using those resources, which projects we may need to make modifications to, to hopefully reduce some of our risk or operate in a different manner to reduce some of our risk. So uh, kind of the general topics we're going to be talking about here is first we'll talk about direct economic damages. So this is what pe people typically think about, which is water hits my home, I have damage now. Or water floods my vehicle, I have damage now. So um, this also can include agricultural damages. We don't typically see that in as many of um, our studies, but you know, it depends on location along the Mississippi River. We would have a lot of agricultural damage sort of calculations. Um, so it's definitely available to you, but it may not always make sense to include that particular component if you're building a life sim model. Um, we also will talk about indirect economic losses um, and a couple of different tools that are available to estimate those. Um, and of course, that's more of, I'll save it actually, we'll, we'll talk about it. And then we'll go through lost benefits, which is kind of some other categories associated with the use of the particular project. And then of course, there's repair and replacement costs. How much is it going to cost me if this thing blows and I have to either fix something or replace the entire thing? Um, and then we'll kind of talk about the general framework of what all of these sort of different categories fit into. So starting with direct economic, uh, direct damage estimation. So again, this is what you're probably used to thinking about, which is your structure gets flooded, your vehicle gets flooded, there's uh, flooded, there's contents within your structure, within your vehicle that per perhaps you would lose during a flood event. Um, and so when we're considering these types of damages, um, the structure attributes in our structure inventory really matter, right? So where is the structure located? Where's your vehicle located when the flood comes? Um, what is the construction type? That helps you inform your occup occupancy type as well as your stability criteria that we talked about. Um, what's the structure value? Now when we're talking about structure value, keep in mind we're usually talking in terms of depreciated replacement costs and not necessarily market values. So what that means, depreciated replacement cost, that is the cost to, uh, basically the materials cost um, to sort of repair or make fixes, not necessarily to go on Zillow. Um, does anyone else have an obsession with Zillow? I don't know, I do. I just kind of browse houses for no reason that I can't afford, but it wouldn't be that value, right? So don't think about going, you know, when you're thinking about the damages, and this is really important, I want to emphasize this because what you're going to see happen a lot of times is you calculate economic damages and your sponsor says, oh no, that's, you know, whoever you're doing this for, they're going to say, no, my house is worth way more than that or my business is worth way more than that, yada, yada. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am, it is. However, I want to think about how much it would cost to actually replace that structure. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, also, of course, with the structures, there's associated contents, and so that's why you're, one of the reasons your occupancy type really matters. Um, the content damages associated with this hotel would be a lot different than my apartment, right? So considering what types of materials are inside, um, if you're in a big manufacturing area, an industrial facility, they've got huge mach machinery that's probably very specialized, you need to have some sort of consideration for that as well um, and account for that within your content values. <clears throat> and then, of course, car values. Um, that one, uh, very similar to what we've already discussed. And then there's this other values category. So that just kind of depends on your study area. Um, again, maybe you are looking at certain structures that have very specialized sort of equipment or very specialized purposes um, and you need to account for that in some way. So that could kind of get nestled into this, what we're calling other, and you could sort of uh, build that out on your own based off the information you have. 
And then of course with this foundation heights are become really important because we're assuming that water does not enter a structure until it reaches that first floor. Um, so making sure that you don't have, that your structure has a four foot foundation height when really it's a half foot um, is very critical to understanding the flooding and associated damages with that structure. Um, same thing with ground elevation, wanna make sure you have a good understanding of your terrain and a good understanding of the uncertainty in your terrain estimates, right? We know not all LIDAR is perfect. Some of it we might be within a couple feet. Sometimes we might say we're in a couple inches. So it's really important to understand that because that informs your economic uncertainty as well. Um, hydraulic parameters, there's a key one missing over here. So depth and velocity are obviously really important to this. Also arrival time can be really important to vehicle damages, right? Because what if I have moved my vehicle and it's no longer in the flooded area? We wanna make sure that we understand when the water would arrive so that we understand if people may have already left. We've already talked about the NSI, but this is just a reminder that within the core, we have this really good tool to help us come up with these structure attributes. And pretty soon this tool will be also available publicly. So keep that in mind. So starting kind of with our direct economic damage estimation. So within life sim, the first thing that we ask ourselves um, is, uh, is questions regarding the stability of that structure. So this is where all that structural stability stuff we talked about earlier this week kind of comes into play. The assumption we would have is that if your uh, depths and velocities are such that the structure loses its stability and collapses, we would assume 100% damage. So this is the first thing we have to ask ourselves. Does this structure collapse? Um, and again, just a quick reminder, velocity, depth, anything above this red line collapsed, anything in between in this blue shaded area, that could be a collapse. And that's what we're trying to model and capture. And this is, again, this is why your structure att attributes are also really important because your stability is informed by the construction type of an individual structure. And so then the next part of this is if the structure does not collapse, we want to get an estimate of how much damage is in within that particular structure. And we'll talk, we'll, we'll go through a little example of this here in a minute. But again, the key elements here is you have to have a good understanding of your first floor elevation. Um, you have to have a good understanding of your ground terrain to help you get an understanding of what your maximum water surface elevation at that location would be at any point of time throughout the, um, the flood. And then that informs the depth that we would say is on the structure. That's the depth of flooding on that particular location. And then once we have this value, that's when we come over to our depth damage functions and we associate that maximum depth with a per, uh, particular percent damage. And we'll talk about more about depth damage functions in an upcoming slide as well. And so uh, here's an example of what I kind of mean by this and to highlight why your first floor elevations are so important. Um, and I bring that up because a lot of times we'll be looking through studies and I'll pull up a structure inventory someone's been working on and I'll look in a, a neighborhood that's in a hot spot and the first floor elevations will just be kind of crazy for that particular area and that really impacts their estimates, right? So quick, easy way to sort of um, do this. You obviously can't do this for every structure and every study, but go on Google Earth, look at a neighborhood that you know is getting a lot of damage, sit your little man on the street, look around, see what kind of the first floor elevations are looking at, you know, on your best guess without having to go out there. And if you have the opportunity to go out there, go out there and figure it out. So I'm just going to cover up. We're going to just pretend this is all ground here. <clears throat> well, not pretend it is, but here we go. Okay, so we're starting to get flooded waters, and as the water rise, um, I've now hit the first floor elevation of that structure in the middle here. And so this is what, you know, this could be however much water it is, but it's not very much, right? Now I get flooding up to the second structure, and now I would be considered to have reached the first floor elevation of this structure. So again, this is just to highlight how important it is to have your attributes correct going into this. Um, this house, uh, maybe, you know, maybe this would, this is enough depths and velocities to collapse this partic particular structure and maybe not its neighbor right here. So make sure um, you're kind of accounting for, especially at communities where we've already went in, done some structural raises or some sort of non-structural measure or something like that because they're known to have flooding issues. 
So more on our depth damage functions. So again, a depth damage function is helping us um, understand the relationship between depth and percent damage. Um, there's many different uh, depth damage functions that sort of exist out there, right? And there's kind of three key ways we see that people estimate these relationships. One of which is expert elicitation, which means we all could sit around in a room and based on what we know and maybe some surveys of the community, we would sort of estimate, we would do our best guess of what the, dam the damage associated with particular depths were. There's also, of course, empirical, which is based off observational data. And then synthetic, <clears throat> which is, you know, more, um, more based on, um, again, sort of an, an analysis sort of approach. And so um, I've listed some sources down here in your notes just for some of the depth damage functions that are common in the core. You can also do a Google search and find, you know, other ones that exist out there that may be applicable to your study. If not, you can, of course, create your own. And within the core, we're actually working on updating these depth damage functions as a whole to include um, hopefully some more parameters that are important to flooding other than just depth. Um, so we can have a better understanding of uh, damages. And we'll talk about what some of those other parameters are soon. So again, just a quick sort of overview. This is a very simple concept. Um, you probably don't need me to walk you through it, but just in case, um, let's just imagine here that we have a first floor elevation of two feet and we have a maximum water surface elevation of 20 feet. So my assumption then would be that I have 18 feet of water on this structure. I figure out what the occupancy type of that structure is find my depth damage curve for that particular occupancy type, and I say I'm at 18 feet, and <clears throat> the percent damage associated with that particular depth, let's just say in this case is 68%. My house is, has a depreciated replacement value of $100,000, 68% of that, I have $68,000 in damages. So this is basically sort of the, the computation that's happening within LifeSim um, to help us come up with these economic damages. And you would do that, oh, go ahead. Are basements taken into account? We do have some depth damage functions that account for basements. Um, those can get a little a little funky sometimes. So a lot of times you'll, you'll kind of see those lower values ignored. But yes, that is a possibility as well. Good question. <clears throat> and, and I guess the other thing to add to that is we typically wouldn't consider that unless it was considered livable space. So um, maybe it's your garage or whatever, and I know you've got your vehicle in there, and it's you know an old hot rod from the 50s or 60s, but we, prob we wouldn't probably count that unless it was someone was actually living in that space of the home. And then, of course, you would do the same sort of similar, uh, the, the model is doing a similar calculation for your contents, um, any other attributes you've assigned, and also your vehicles. And so some of, like, some of the reasons that we are working on updating depth damage functions and some of the things that are missing from this calculation of estimated damage are all these sort of variables here, right? Like how long is the structure or the vehicle going to be flooded? Is there, is, are we in a coastal area where it's salt water versus in Tennessee where I am, where it's you know river water or what have you? Um, that can lead to more corrosion and whatnot. Um, humidity takes a big factor into here. Time to re-entry, what I mean by that is how long did all my content sit there before, not only they endured the flood, let's say the flood lasted three days and so they're wet for three days, but then I can't get back into my home for three more days. So now they've been sitting there and I've not been able to go take care of my belongings and so now they're just getting even worse, right? Contaminants, um, this is something that we kind of talked about in indirect life loss that can, you know, there's possibility that there's things in the water that are making the conditions worse, right? And can lead to more damages. Um, erosion or wave height in, in coastal areas, something to consider. And then intervention. In the example I gave of Baldwin Hills where the fire or, or the police officers get stuck in the home and so they decide to carry the organ upstairs, you know, like have you had an opportunity and the time to move some of your things out of the way, to get your vehicle out of the study area to reduce some of your overall economic damages? So there's a lot of things that can go into this, right? So just keep in mind sort of the, the computation that currently happens um, has a lot of uncertainty. So this is all things to think about based off where you're located um, and what types of structures you have in your inventory. <clears throat> so the next piece of this is the agricultural damage. Um, and again, sort of 
the key parameters that matter here, location always. Um, it really matters what type of crop you're growing. Some crops are more robust than others um, and have different developmental cycles where they are more susceptible to flooding at different stages of the developmental process. Um, the How much you expect to get the value of that crop essentially, like how much am I going to make when I harvest this crop? What is it worth? When do I plant? Did I have to plant the crop late? Did I get to uh, plant it on time or was there a flooding issue and so I didn't get to do that and that changes the value of my harvest? Think about your sort of farmer's almanac, you know, if any, I don't know if, you know, any of you farm or anything, but thinking about, you know, you've got the farmers out there and they're like, okay, I need to plant under the full moon on this day, this time of year. You know, it's really important when you plant these crops. And so that's one of the huge factors that plays into this. And then of course, the duration. How long are the crops flooded? And when does the water sort of arrive to them? And how long does it stay there? And so basically this calculation gets split into two pieces, one which is that seasonally based, a seasonally based value. So again, that is what is the crop value? Did I get to plant on time? Did I have to plant the crop late? So if I'm able to harvest my crop, what is it worth? So that's going to inform our damage estimate. And then also the duration and also sort of the timing throughout the year when it was flooded. And that again comes into the developmental process of that particular crop. Um, among other things. So for the seasonally based value, um, again, if a crop planted late, you could have a different value. Um, I think I've kind of honed in on that quite, probably enough. And then for the seasonally based damage, again, uh, some crops are better able to withstand flooding conditions. This kind of image here sort of shows you what that could potentially look like. So you've got damage, percent damage on your y-axis and time of year on your x-axis. And then the blue line here is uh, duration of flooding is one day, and the red line would be duration of flooding is three days. So notice that when it's flooded longer, my percent damage goes up. And if I'm flooded in January for this particular crop, I have less damage than if I'm flooded in April, May time for this particular crop. And so of course this would look different depending on what the crop is. So really important to take sort of stock of your crop inventory in your area. Um, we often use uh, National Agricultural Statistics, some other S, I can't remember what the last S is, but the NAS data that some of you are probably familiar with. So that's usually what we feed into the model to help us address this. And it's really good at providing you sort of the basics of the crop budget, the crop value, um, and all those good things. So next piece of this is indirect economics, and this is where it starts getting even a little more fuzzy, right? Because it's like, how much indirect, uh, how far do you go out? But basically what we're trying to capture here is how um, a change or a shock to the system in one industry impacts all the other industries. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with in-plan and input-output model um, that's aggregated across, I think, like 536 economic sectors, or at least it was la last time I used it. Um, and so we're basically saying, okay, for instance, if I flood out uh, some cropland, let's say it's wheat in this, in this case, if I flood out all my wheat fields, how does that affect the bread industry? How does that affect farm equipment industry? How does that affect the meat industry? I'm going to be very upset if I can't have charcuterie. Um, so it's, you know, it's thinking through all these different things and how those, those markets impact each other. Um, and when we're thinking about this, basically what we're trying to capture is capital and material losses and then also uh, labor productivity losses. So how do these shocks to the market affect my goods and services and how does that affect the people in those industries and their availability to work and provide for themselves? And so just a little graphic to kind of um, explain this a little bit more. So we've got labor and capital and materials and all these businesses need these inputs. And then using those inputs, they produce their products and services and it's just a cycle, right? And so if you have a shock to one of the, if you have a shock from a flood event or something, and now you don't have those available materials and resources, um, you're not able to produce the goods and services and it's just an, a, a repeating cycle, right? And so this kind of, this is again, it's like, where do you draw the line? It's very similar when we were talking about indirect life loss, you know, it's how far out in time can we really look before things start getting fuzzy? It's 
how large do you say the community impacts from this are before it gets a little fuzzy like if, if it floods in my neighbor in my community does it affect my neighboring county and the other neighboring county does the effects from those counties affect their neighboring county so it's kind of hard to draw the line here so things to consider um, and sometimes it'll be a little more a bit more obvious than others and then sometimes maybe it's uh, maybe the impacts are more national scale and at that point you want to put a lot more consideration in this right um, as, as opposed to if it's just localized um, impacts so this is nashville tennessee where i live i did not label this graphic but i do find it entertaining this is some bad bar somebody's jeep you know so i really i really like whoever the humor of whoever did this but this is downtown nashville uh, this street here is Broadway, which is a very popular tourist destination right here along the river. Well, this, okay, so I guess I should say this right here is where the river usually is. Um, and then, of course, now we have this huge major problem. Uh, this is our Nissan Stadium. There's a train that um, runs to all the eastern suburbs east of downtown Nashville that drops off here. I take that to work. Um, and then these are pretty much bars, businesses, banks, all that good stuff. So think about the indirect economics of a situation like this, right? So first of all, my tourism is going to go way down. So tourism is extremely popular or extremely important to Nashville economics right and so all of a sudden I, I have lost my like prized possession I've lost Broadway like what are we going to do and then you also have to consider a lot of these right through here are bars so now you've affected all the alcohol distributors in the area <clears throat> And then also you've got, now you've got people, they're not gonna be able to go to work right here. Um, all these businesses are gonna be closed for how long? How are they gonna generate profits? How are they gonna support themselves? What are these employees gonna do? Um, for all these businesses that aren't bars up here and their employees take the train or public transit that runs through this area, how are they gonna get to work also? So it kind of just, again, it's just kind of an example to sort of expand on like, Sometimes we tend to focus just on direct economic damages and think about, well, now I have to replace the floors and I need new drywall and I've got to get new inventory. It's so much beyond that, right? So just always keep that in mind when you're thinking through your economics problems. Uh, for your direct damages, it's really important to have your maximum depths and your water surface elevations, your first floor elevations, your ground floor elevations, and then also arrival time of water. Um, it's really important also to correctly label your occupancy types and assign appropriate stability criteria so you determine if a structure would potentially collapse or not. Agriculture, extremely duration is the key factor there and knowing what types of crops you have. And then indirect economic damages is considering sort of the extent of how, how long um, this particular event could Im impact the local, regional, potentially national economies. So moving on to um, lesser known, um, or I guess I shouldn't say lesser known, lesser thought about uh, benefits for a lot of um, a lot of times is kind of the the purposes of that particular project. So if I have um, in Nashville, we have J. Percy Priest Reservoir, and that particular reservoir is authorized for recreation. It's authorized for flood risk um, mitigation or management, I should say. It's authorized for water supply. And it's also authorized, I believe, for hydropower. So um, if, if that particular structure goes away or it's damaged and cannot operate as intended for a certain amount of time, what is the losses economically there as well? So that's what we're talking about here. Um, other, <clears throat> again, this could, it's very project specific if you would have something sort of in this other category or not. The one I tend to think of is like um, nuclear. Um, so where I'm from in East Tennessee, uh, those projects support the nuclear industry there heavily. And so that's not something that would necessarily be captured in one of these other accounts. So, you know, be aware of what critical infrastructure you have in your communities um, and, and what these projects are fully supporting, whether intended or not, right? And so the first one is uh, flood risk management. And the core, the way we look at that is we consider our historical flood damages prevented. So basically we say um, in the natural conditions, if this project um, was not here, what would flooding potentially look like versus now we do have this project, how have we sort of reduced the risk there? Um, and that's how we would calculate this and that's something that we do annually. 
So we use that to sort of inform how, if this project goes down, how many um, damages prevented am I not preventing? A, a fun way to word that. Um, and then for hydropower, uh, in the core, we base this on average sort of hydro production over five years, the previous five years. And then we also consider the regional price of that power. Um, navigation, this is based on transportation savings rates. So you can kind of think that could be a, a several different things. So is it is it better for me as a shipper to um, ship my goods via water versus via rail? Um, if the lock is closed down, is it going to take me longer to get my goods where I need to get them to go? And how is that going to impact my sales and impact all these other things, right? And impact the consumers on the other end. So basically for this, we sort of look at, um, we have some shipper, I always forget the acronym, shipper container, shipper carrier cost, shipper carrier cost. Yeah, Jordan's like, yes, that's the one. Uh, shipper carrier cost that we use to help us calculate this. Um, and basically what we would do is we look at a, a sort of range of potential lot closures from like a day to 365 days. And then based off what the particular breach is or the particular failure is for that project, we'd say, okay, we're estimating it's probably going to take six months of repairs uh, to get this thing running again and get traffic moving again. So what's that going to cost? And then we've got our municipal water supply. And this is, again, if the authorized use of a reservoir behind like a dam, for example, if you have communities coming in and getting um, water for their water supply out of there, what are the contracts uh, for a million gallons per day from those different communities? And how much does it cost? What's like sort of the average cost of allocating the, the water to those communities? So those are what we would consider here. There's also this irrigation water supply factor, which is based off um, the federal cost for irrigation by project. And this is actually based on the time uh, at which that project was first constructed, at least within the core. So again, I know this is really high overview. So if you have any more like detailed or like questions on this, feel free to find me later and we can talk through it. Um, within the core, we have a tool uh, produced by a modeling mapping and consequence center that helps us calculate all these. So all the data has been pulled very nicely into one central location for us. And it's uh, we have all of our projects in our portfolio that have these different types of benefits listed. And so it's very easy for us in the core to kind of calculate some of these. Um, I know that's not quite as simple for other agencies. So we can help you talk through maybe where you could find data and how you'd go about doing this. Um, and how and when it might be appropriate to go into more detail on a specific one of these categories. And then recreation, of course, if people want to boat or swim, fish, what have you, on the reservoir or even downstream in the channel, we consider um, annual visitation for this and then also unit day values. And what a unit day value is, is basically an estimate of a consumer's willingness to pay to use uh, that recreational resource. And so there's different, um, there's different ways that we could, um, different methods we could use to come up with those unit day values, uh, surveys, uh, travel cost method. There's several different ways we could come up with that. But basically we say for this particular area, how much do we expect people will pay to use it? And then we use those values to inform this analysis. And then again, we've got other, again, I, I commonly think of things such as nuclear power or something of that nature, critical infrastructure. It could also include things such as water quality, if that's um, a really well-known issue in your area or emergency response costs. Like, how much does it cost for me as an emergency manager to get my other uh, neighbors to come in and help me mitigate the issues I'm having, help me go out and rescue people, help me get resources, food, water, shelter to all these people? What is that costing? Um, of course, that can be very difficult. Um, to estimate, um, but could be very important. And so this one, these ones, you don't, you, we don't see people go through the process of calculating just as, or as often as the other loss benefits, but that's not to say they're not very important. They are, and my, I would suspect that in the future, this will be uh, developed more as well. And then of course, it's how much does it cost to repair uh, the damages? This is Oroville Dam. You've probably seen this image. Um, and so we typically base that off the original construction cost. Um, 
index to current values. And then um, the pro it depends on the size of the breach, right? So we would sort of estimate, okay, are we going to have, did we have three gates, three gates out of eight gates fell? And what would that potentially look like? And then we kind of use percentages um, using our expert judgment to determine what repair costs would be sort of at a screening level. And then uh, for our higher risk projects, we'd go into a more detailed analysis where we might work with cost estimators, we'd work with our engineers, our structural engineers, all the, all the important team members to kind of help us actually put um, more serious sort of numbers to this, right? Um, and so you'd see that on your larger infrastructure and your very high risk projects. And all of this, uh, this is really important to Corps of Engineers folks, maybe not as important to people in other groups, but we kind of fit all of this into the framework of these specific four accounts, which is national economic development, environmental quality, regional economic development, and other social effects. Um, so some of what we've already talked about fits really nicely into these boxes already. So like, um, like flood risk management, we would consider that sort of a national benefit. Um, regional economic development, we would consider like recreation to fit into this category pretty well. Um, environmental quality, again, if you've got if you've got like an endangered species or some sort of habitat that you're destroying downstream, we could calculate maybe some sort of unit or some sort of monetary value associated with that, and that would fit nicely here. And then other social effects, um, life loss fits very nicely into other social effects, and that's a byproduct of that it doesn't fit nicely into the other three. Um, but other things that might go into the OSC account is consideration for um, am I looking at a very uh, vulnerable community, a socially vulnerable community, a disadvantaged community? These are all buzzwords you're all probably hearing throughout your agencies. So considerations for that. So if I flood a very low income neighborhood, is there some sort of consideration I need to have for it's going to take them longer potentially to bounce back after that event? So that's some discussion we would also include in this account. And so there's, there's a lot of things that could fit into this. And I just kind of bring this up to say this is sort of the general framework we're trying to think within and fit all these benefits in and make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, some generally omitted economic elements that may be important to your study. So we've talked about some of these already throughout the week. Um, we don't often talk about how much it's going to cost to like unclog debris, like unclog culverts, unclog spillway gates, do all that sort of thing when you've get, got things jammed in like this picture. That's going to cost a pretty penny, both monetarily and with time. And so that's things to consider. Um, environmental cleanup costs, again, this is something that you know, there's other agencies des uh, designated to thinking through this a little bit more, but it's also really important for our consideration. Um, traffic delays, um, again, that could be both like uh, the barges going in and out um, of the locks, but it also could mean, okay, did this particular flood event block a road, did debris block a road, did a critical road downstream get washed away, and how is that going to impact local traffic potentially? Um, and then the evacuation costs, Orville Dam is a great example where there was um, a lot of costs associated with that. And then emergency action costs, again, rescue, um, getting other personnel in there all the time and resources it takes to do that. So there's, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just, again, something to help you kind of get your mind working on other potential things you might want to consider. And very similarly to, to life loss, we plot this on sort of this FN chart. And we use this to help us rack and stack. I know this image was brought up earlier. And so the question is, is when does economics kind of come into play? Um, life safety is paramount, right? So we always consider life loss sort of first in our risk estimates. So you've got these different projects that are all, um, they have different desac ratings. So we're saying the risk associated with that project is different, uh, but they kind of fall into this uh, similar category because maybe the probability is driving the risk or something of that nature. Economics would be that second piece where we say, okay, life loss for these two projects is very similar, but economic consequences for this project is way higher. So it would make more sense for us to allocate resources to that project probably prior to allocating resources to another project. So I, I don't want to say economics is um, not important. I would just say it's sort of secondary a lot of times in our analysis because we want to put life safety first. Um, and so with that, that's all I've got for you.